Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What? It's not on. It's not on. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be with you all. And the mercy and the blessings of Allah. Well, thank you very much, Sean. And thank you to everybody who's been uh, gracious and kind enough to uh, come out tonight to listen to me and my little story, which I've entitled, uh, intriguingly, Sean says, Not the Pirates of the Caribbean. And I've called it that because I wanted to share with you some little bits, anecdotes from history this evening. So, I guess I should start by, uh, by asking ourselves, uh, you know, is a story true or not? And in this case, of course, uh, we can tell stories which are not actually true, but of course they have a good meaning or a good moral behind them. Or you can tell a story which is true, which also have a very intriguing or interesting or different perspective to them. And I'd like to start by perhaps talking why I chose this particular title. Not Pirates of the Caribbean. So, well, it's not Pirates and it's not the Caribbean. Well, it's not really not Pirates, because Pirates, when you think of Pirates, you're generally thinking of maybe cutthroats, uh, buccaneers, scoundrels, villains, uh, the skull and crossbones, murderous people. But the people I'm talking about aren't quite like that. At least most of them aren't. And what I'm going to talk to you about doesn't occur in the Caribbean. It occurs generally in the Mediterranean and in particular around the coast of North Africa. History, they say, is a foreign country. And they say that, I think, because history sometimes appears very strange to us. When we read or hear about what people did or the experiences they had in the past, we think, wow, that sounds really strange. Surely, you know, those sorts of things don't happen these days. And what a strange world it must have been if people thought and did those sorts of things at that time. But my story starts actually with a little story in itself. For those of you who come from England, and there's a few of us in the audience who have, you'll be very familiar with the story, or the stories surrounding Sir Francis Drake. Sir Francis Drake, of course, was not a pirate. He was, in fact, what was called a privateer. And a privateer is what you might call a gentleman pirate. A privateer was a pirate who was contracted by a party to use their pirating skills to harass the enemy, entitled to take whatever loot and booty they wanted, as long as they gave at least 10% to their sponsor. Now Sir Francis Drake, great seaman, circumnavigated the globe. He was a privateer under the auspices and the authority of Queen Elizabeth, of whom a few movies have been made just recently. And of course the legend goes that in about 1588, the Spanish sought to attack England and they amassed a huge flotilla, a huge fleet of ships, which was called the Armada, hundreds and hundreds of ships. And the story goes that as they sailed up the English Channel on their way to teach England a good lesson, Sir Francis Drake was at Plymouth Hoe and he was playing bowls. And one of his captains, a Captain Fleming, rushed up to him and informed him of the news. And Captain Fleming was the captain of the ship, the Golden Hind. Rushed up to him with the news that the Spanish Armada was coming. And Drake's very measured, very noble response was, well, there's plenty of us, plenty of time for us to finish this game and beat the Spanish too. 
Now, of course, nobody was there. There were no paparazzi there at the time to record exactly what Drake said. And in fact, it was only published about 40 years later in some pamphlets. So, of course, perhaps a little bit of poetic license was taken in actually reporting what Drake may or may not have said. The intriguing part about this story relates to a phone call I got from a friend many, many years ago who said to me, do you know that story about Drake, you know, bowling, and the man comes up and says, you know, the Spanish are coming, the Spanish are coming. And he very calmly says, yeah, okay, they can wait. He knew that time and tide were against them anyway, so he could afford to wait. I said, yeah, of course, everybody knows that story. I said, did you know that the man who came to tell him the story was a Muslim? Oh, I said, oh, no, I didn't know that. And so I began to think about this. And I thought I'd do a little bit of research and share it with you. Luckily, of course, I didn't have to do a great deal of research because a lot of people have been there before me. One of the wonders of the internet is you don't have to do a great deal of work, you just need to push the right buttons and put in the key words in search engines. So I came up with a few things. Firstly, I couldn't confirm that Captain William Fleming was in fact a Muslim, but it's probably true that he was. What can be confirmed though is this, that many of Drake's captains were converts to Islam. And the intriguing thing is, well, how did that occur? Well, of course, as gentlemen pirates as they were, as privateers, many of them, of course, they didn't operate around England, even though they may have been working for Queen Elizabeth or for other parties. And they basically hired themselves out to the, to the man or the woman, the king or the queen, with the highest bid, or whose services they thought they could use or enjoy to the best of their ability. And because they may have been regarded as pirates at home, they generally had their headquarters, their bases, far away from home. So these pirates, and they came from many of the European countries, from Spain, from Holland, from England, from Italy. They based themselves around what was called the Barbary Coast, the coast of North Africa. Algiers, Tunisia, Morocco. And this is where they set out on their raids. You remember at the time, or maybe you don't remember because you weren't there at that time, but in the time of the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, the Mediterranean was ruled mostly by Muslim navies, or in this case around North Africa, by what was called the Muslim Ottoman Corsairs. Corsair was just another nice name, I guess, for a North African pirate. And when the English privateers based themselves there, they came into contact with Muslims, and some of them embraced Islam. And they found that living in North Africa was very much to their lifestyle. Nice climate, beautiful Mediterranean, and a civilized lifestyle which perhaps wasn't quite so welcoming in England, or in France, or in Spain, or in Italy, for people like themselves. Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, whom some of you may have had the pleasure of meeting when he was here, visiting a couple of years ago, a scholar from Cambridge University, also known of course by his, his former name, Timothy Winter, Dr. Tim Winter. He wrote a very wonderful article about one particular pirate, an Englishman by the name of Captain John Ward, also working as one of Drake's captains for a period of time. 